Hello. So as you can see, uh, I've very fortunately been given a Lifetime Achievement Award at this meeting, but I have to pay for it with a talk. And the talk is on the 10 secrets of success in science, according to Trevor. And we'll see really whether there are 10 or maybe more than 10. We'll see how it goes. So the first principle I want to talk about relates to school really, your school qualifications for those of you who are still studying for your A-levels for example to get to university. And a firm piece of advice is do science A-levels at school and I would completely agree with that. It's really important to do science A-levels at school if you want to be successful at science. However, the A-levels I would concentrate on, my secret, are as follows. Study and master statistics. So make sure you do maths and study statistics because statistics for us, for my science, is the most valuable branch of mathematics. And it's something that will help you throughout your career, even if it's not in science, for example, in business. So do learn your statistics. And also, learn how to write. Now, by English, I don't mean necessarily read the novels of Jane Austen, although I think they are very good novels and I recommend them. What I really mean is learn to write well. Learn to write in a nice style, which is very readable. Because when you're communicating your science to your colleagues or to the public, it's very important that it reads nicely and so they understand what you say. Okay, so let's go to our second principle, which is get a good degree. And also, of course, get a good doctoral degree, if possible. Now, in terms of my secrets, however, secret number two is follow your gut research interests. In other words, don't do degrees which you think other people want you to do, do what you want to do. Follow your intuitions, follow your gut feelings about what your scientific interests are likely to be, even if they don't appear to be very mainstream. And if you think you have what it takes, regardless of grades, just go for it. That's my advice. Study what you're interested in, because the chances are that you'll make a success of it. The third principle, is join after your degree a top research group to do for example a PhD or your postdoctoral work and by a top research group I mean a group which has a real research leader someone you can look up to and use as a role model whether that's in academia universities or in industry with a leading industrial group the secret however is make sure they're fun to work with. It's really important in science to collaborate and cooperate, to act as part of a team. And science is social, and so it makes it so much more enjoyable if you all work together to produce great science. Principle number four, do great science, and do great science, if you can, on important topics that will have impact. That's a main principle, but the secret is be cagey, be clever and careful. Have your main projects, which we call the alpha projects, these are the, the fantasies, the things you'd really like to do to become famous, but they may be a bit too ambitious. But on the side, have your beta projects, your bread and butter projects, that will enable you to get your PhD or your fellowship or whatever. In other words, good science, which is worth doing and worth publishing, it may not rewrite the science books, but it will advance your career. And you might just be lucky enough that your alpha project works. And of course, in any of these projects, if something exciting happens, drop everything and study it. Really make the most of any surprising, exciting findings you find with this strategy. Principle number five, and this is a very important strategy in science, attention to detail. You've got to get things right. You've got to be precise. If you're not precise, things won't work. 
and replicate your findings, make sure they're reliable. And from that base, that platform, build on it and extend the findings further. That's the best way to proceed. But the secret is, at the same time, be imaginative and creative in your research. Take a multidisciplinary perspective. In other words, try and use converging methods and findings to drive a point home, to provide really good evidence for a particular conclusion. I call this total football. Use all the approaches you can to make sure you're right. Actually, combining being imaginative with this attention to detail is actually quite a tough thing to do in a scientist, but if you can do it, you're bound to be successful. Principle six, disseminate your work carefully. What do we mean by disseminate? Well, we mean go out there and talk about it at scientific meetings and publish it so that people can read it and also, of course, engage with the public and the media so that everyone understands what you're doing. But the secrets are go to lots of scientific meetings and local seminars and take every opportunity you can to talk about the work and also publish. If the work is sound scientifically and reliable, publish it. Don't be afraid to publish it. In my early career, I thought I was only ever going to publish my very, very best work. But you know what? I came to regret that. Because what I found is that a lot of other people out there were doing similar things. But they did them less well than me, and they went ahead and published it. And I felt, when they saw their, their, their papers, I thought, what a shame. I could, have, I could have published this much better and got the credit for it. So don't ever regret failing to publish work which is of suitable standard. Publish and be damned. If you're wrong, it won't matter very much. No one will cite it. They'll forget about your failures. You should focus on your successes. Principle number seven. Publish, of course, they will say, in good journals. What is a good journal? There are so many different types of journal. Some journals are very high profile, like Nature and Science, and if you publish in them, you'll be famous. Other journals are very solid. Um, you perhaps won't be famous, but you'll certainly get a good scientific education by interacting with constructive referees. So a high profile journal, they may not even bother to review your paper. But in a sound journal, they will at least give you that that possibility of constructive review. But the secret is, don't get too obsessed by these journal impact factors by which journals are rated. They're very bizarre statistics anyway. They simply relate to the number of times in the first couple of years your paper is cited. So, of course, it could be cited a lot and then die a death. But it may be better for a paper to be a steady earner, to gradually come online and be recognised for what it is, a major contribution. So what you should focus on ultimately, of course, are citations, how many people read your work and think it's worthwhile to cite it. But also, how long these citations last, the half-life of a paper, how long it survives in the scientific consciousness because that's ultimately going to be your legacy to science. Principle number eight, teaching. Now this is an interesting one. You have a dilemma. If you're a researcher, do you also teach? Should you gain teaching experience to preserve your career options? Because after all, it's very hard to make a career simply out of research. Particularly in the UK, there are very few career options where you can simply research without any other commitments. These lucky individuals, for example, may have research professorships, or work in an MRC unit or whatever, and all they can do is research. But for most of us, this is not possible. 
we have to gain lectureships, generally in universities or other institutions. But of course the other point of view is, for heaven's sake, don't get bogged down too much with teaching because it'll take all your time away from research and so you will not be able to fulfil your scientific objectives. So how do you resolve this dilemma? Well, this is what I say. Teaching will help you. It is worthwhile doing teaching as a lecturer. It will help your science in two senses. First of all, it will enable you to explain things so much more clearly to your scientific colleagues. So your talks at conferences will have much greater impact as a consequence. And secondly, the dissemination of your work is much better following teaching experience. You can engage articulating in a very easy way with the community. You don't have the pressures of social anxiety when you're discussing your work in public. So these are the great advantages of teaching, enabling you to clarify and enhance your presentations. Principle number nine. Of course, ultimately, you have to communicate your findings through journals, as we said earlier, but you have to become self-sufficient. You have to write your first drafts of papers so that you get the credit for not only perhaps designing the work and carrying it out and analysing the results, but also writing the paper itself, which is the goal, ultimately. Without the paper, the work doesn't count, really, because you have to communicate it. So do write your first drafts as soon as possible. Get over that hurdle, because there are so many young scientists out there who are excellent at doing the techniques and the methods, but they simply can't get the results published out there. They can't write the work up. So get over that hurdle. And this is also true for grant applications as well. Grant applications are going to be very important in supporting your work because you have to get funds to support other people to help you in the work or the costs of research, which are enormous. You have to get grants. So get used to writing grant applications and submitting them. But the secret is don't worry too much about rejection, either for papers or for grants. Be resilient and persist. Your paper will eventually find a home, perhaps not the one you wanted for it originally. And your grant probably will be funded ultimately in some form. So just don't lose heart. Persist, revise, revise it on the basis of constructive reviews from journal referees and any feedback you can get from research councils or charities like the Wellcome Trust and then resubmit it somewhere else, taking heed of their advice. Principle number 10, we're nearly there, perhaps. But no, principle 9a, you see, I'm changing it. This is a common admonition that you have from advisors. Become independent, they say. So when you're in this research group or research team, you've got to demonstrate that you're the person who can do all of this independently without help from your supervisor and your other mentors. It's all very well this, and I agree it is important to show independence by writing papers and getting grants and so on. However, I do come back to this team ethic, and the secret is you have to balance this independence still with working in a team. Science is teamwork, and no one is totally independent. And you know what? Your supervisor is not independent either of you. And they need your help just as much you probably still need theirs. So you have to strike a suitable balance, a negotiation between yourself and your team and your supervisor. Principle next, 10. Move around. So they often say, it's best to move around. Get some experience here, do something, move on and gradually climb the academic ladder. I think this is quite good advice because change is good, ex new experiences are good, and they, they help you to achieve what, what I was calling earlier total football, where you bring together all these strands in a scientific project. 
However, I think there's another side to this. Many of us can't move around very much because we may have a young family, for example, and a partner. And it's not absolutely essential to move around. Um, so the secret is you can still move around by staying where you are, in a sense, as long as you form active connections with people. You can use the web and gain a whole lot of novel experiences and connections, but essentially be staying put in your own institution if that's where you're happiest and at your most productive. Well, that's principle 10, but as I warned you at the beginning of the talk, I couldn't necessarily restrain myself to 10 principles. And so I do have an extra principle at the end. Aim high, career-wise. Become a professor. Get a chair, if you can, somewhere, through your achievements. The secret when you do this and you form your own research group is nevertheless surround yourself with clever people because they're going to help you and they include of course students as well as postdocs and other fellows. They will immortalise your scientific efforts and your legacy. That's my advice. Thank you.